call is originating from an Ohio correctional institution and may be recorded or monitored. From the onset of this, we have tried desperately, desperately, desperately to get in contact with the news media. We have been stopped by this administration. They think they can confine this incident within the walls of this prison like no other part of the world can hear this. They think they can hide everything like they've been doing down here for years and years. This is not the case. If someone were to approach me who had no knowledge of Lucasville, had no knowledge of the prison and no knowledge of the uprising in 1993, I would initially tell them that given the severity of the oppression experienced um, by people behind bars. The surprising thing is that it took so long for it to be a riot. That there aren't more. And that they're not rioting every day. When you're in a prison and you've dealt through all these different abuses and conditions, that's a kettle that begins to boil. When you treat someone like an animal, it just makes them bite more. I don't know of any case in which a prison riot occurred just for the sake of rioting. There were foundational issues, whether it was a snitching system or uh, some sort of, um, you know, the issues in terms of actual uh, living conditions, those sorts of things that led to it. Uh, the cells are smaller than you can possibly imagine. It's a closet space that is enough room for uh, a bed, a um, sink, and a commode. So if you can imagine being confined uh, with another human being, even a, a loving spouse, for 24 hours every day in, in a small bathroom. I mean, when you take hope away from people, whether they're locked up or they're free on the street, you're creating a pow powder keg, and that's what's going on in a lot of the prisons. And to have the prisons overcrowded in that way. Kind of be like putting people in a, a pressure cooker. Within seconds. Prisoners rioted. That you know, I mean, there's there's no saving that. You know? and that, that scares people. It scares people everywhere. This is Sadiq Abdullah Hassan from Ohio State Penitentiary in Youngstown, Ohio. I wish to emphasize that prison is an unpleasant place to be. It's a hardship not only within, on the prisoners, but on the prisoners' of families as well. And we must take into consideration, too, that although many people are in prison because they actually commit crimes, there are other people that are in prison that didn't commit any crimes. You have a lot of violence. You have correctional officials who are trying to make an extra buck. They bring drugs. They bring weapons into the institutions. These weapons uh, are being used on other prisoners. Uh, prisoners are using drugs, trying to escape the hardships, the brutality, the nonsense that they experience on a daily basis. And I think that mass incarceration impacts all of us, um, though especially some of us. You know, I say we're all criminals. You know, there's not one of us um, who hasn't committed a crime. If you've made it to adulthood, you've committed a crime, you've drank underage, you've experimented with drugs, you've sped on the freeway, you know, you may have shoplifted something from a store. All of us make mistakes and violate the law. We're all criminals, but only some of us get branded. We refer to the prison as Lucasville, but that's not the na actual name of the prison. The prison is called the Southern Ohio Correctional Facility, and it's in Lucasville, Ohio. Uh, Lucasville had a very uh, violent history. There was a long train of abuses, treatment, inhumane conditions, and brutality suffered by prisoners. And more often than not, a prison guard would either instigate the prison on prison violence or were the perpetrators of it themselves. So this is the backdrop that led up to the disturbance. You had a warden at the prison by the name of Arthur Tate Jr., but known to the convict body as simply King Arthur. King Arthur was brought to the prison actually to just try to offset some of the violence that was going on. He instituted Operation Shakedown. He instituted a lot of rules and regulations. 
that was not to the liking of the prisoners as well as his staff. I was actually in, you know, Lucasville because of a race ride in Mansfield. So, you know, if you got anything like that on your record where they run up type of sweeps, you'll get caught up in it. And I end up doing 18 months in the hole for that. And um, that covered, you know, the time during what the ride took place. The warden was clearly aware of the conditions at the prison and was highly advised by his fellow colleagues to calm the hostile conditions at the prison. Well, he did the opposite. He turned up the heat. Then when a new warden came in, he decided to change that, just trying to sell you with anybody, selling white supremacists with black nationalists. They put uh, homophobic prisoners in the cells with known homosexuals. You know, people who smoke with people who don't smoke, things of that nature. It creates a lot of tension. And of course, if you made the call and your mother or whoever wasn't there, tough. Wait till next year. They were given aspirins for serious medical conditions. There was inadequate water, food supply, there was overcrowding of the cells. There was exploitation of inmates. And all the prisoners were dissatisfied with the numerous of things, and they talked about it among themselves. No one took the initiative to take a stance against the problem that had existed within the institution. Almost everyone who has asked me, what was the cause of the uh, Lucasville uprising? And I clearly point out the uh, mandatory TB testing was the straw that broke the camel back. When the uprising began, that the Muslims who started it had in mind something essentially nonviolent. They were protesting the prison's plan. An injection of phenol underneath the skin, which is an alcoholic substance. And was contrary to their religion. Once again, he had an opportunity to say, you know what, we're going to calm the conditions at the prison. This is a violation of your constitutional rights to practice your religion. You're right. Ohio didn't need to do that. There are other ways to test for TB. X-rays, you can spit into a cup. But once the protest got underway, other prisoners had other problems with the prison official because of the physical abuse, the racial insults, and other problems that was going on in the institution. They took this opportunity to make it a full-scale riot. There's word tonight of a prison riot at a maximum security prison in southern Ohio. Hundreds of prisoners took over part of the prison yesterday. Easter Sunday, 450 prisoners armed only with batons stolen from the guards reportedly took cell block L adjacent to death row under siege. Injuring seven guards and taking an undetermined number of guards hostage. Five inmates were killed, 18 others injured. There was an array of armed forces around the prison that hadn't been rivaled since D-Day. Alarms going off. You know, the man down alarms that they have on these TV, you can hear the helicopters flying in and circling. It is not clear yet why or specifically what they want. Prisoners do have constitutional rights. Just because you're a prisoner or because there are gates and doors closed behind you when we become prisoner, it doesn't mean that we forfeit our constitutional rights. On day two of the inmate siege, the sixth body of a prisoner thrown out of the cell block this morning. Lucasville speculates about what sparked the riot. There were horror stories about bodies being stacked up and numbers thrown around about the dead. Um, so obviously that's very disconcerting. It was, it was newspapers and television stations. We sort of jumped the gun because we thought we had good information about the number of bodies that were observed in the prison. And it turned out when the smoke cleared that we were wrong, that the person who told us that was wrong. and. Uh, we were actually conservative compared to some other papers. There was almost a feeling of relief when the whole thing was over because it wasn't nearly as bad as the, as the news media made it out to be to begin with. If they're refusing to give information, then reporters are, are, are forced to resort to other means to get information other than the official channels, and sometimes they're wrong. What the media did not tell was the inhumane conditions. This institution has a long history of racial strife. Tensions against one another, you know, white and black. The group that is referred to as the Lucasville Five, George Skates, Jason Robb, uh, there was members of the Aaron Brotherhood, uh, 
Chief Lamar, also known as Bogmani uh, Shakur, uh, and the latter two are both Sunni Muslim. That is uh, James Ware, also known as Namir Abdul Mateen, and myself, Sadiq Abdullah Hassan. We comprise the Lucas Wafar. And the conditions at Lucasville were so bad that it drove together as one the Aryan Brotherhood, the black gangster disciples, and the black inmates of Muslim faith against an administration. The African-American prisoners involved had come to George. is getting out of control. It's turning into a race riot. Would you, George, address the prisoner body, and in particular, the white prisoners. It is not a racial issue. Black and white alike have joined hands in SOCF and have become one strong unit. This is all of us against the administration. The prison official would not allow us to talk to the media. Some people, they took the big speakers from the gym and they brought it to where the media was actually facing. Prisoners start playing requests, their demands, and when the prison official or prison authority realized they was communicating with the media, they actually cut off the power and electricity. So then prisoners uh, took sheets. It seems that the inmates are trying to get in touch with us, the media. They're hanging sheets outside the windows. So let me get this straight. If I send you two hostages out there, we can discuss the live news coverage. Is that proper? Okay, George, I can't guarantee you that the news media will even talk to you. Oh, cut it out. Now, hold, hold, hold the phone. Now, we're supposed to be eye to eye here, right? Do you think they wouldn't want to talk to one of us or two of us or whatever? The inmates who had taken control of the prison wanted to speak to a journalist. We tossed our business cards into a hat, and uh, the public relations spokesman for the prisons pulled out a, a card. It was my card. This Cleveland newspaper reporter was allowed to talk briefly by phone to one inmate. Guy came to meet me looked just like Spencer Tracy. And he he didn't have any he wasn't wearing a uniform, didn't have any ID, wouldn't introduce himself because I said, Hi, who are you? And he said, You don't need to know that. He said, I'm gonna put you on the phone with with uh, one of these inmates who's claiming to be in control and he said, I want you to listen to him very carefully. And he said, and I'll be listening as well on another phone and answer exactly what I tell you to answer. He said, because if you don't, these people could be killed. And I really believed him. And, and so I did pretty much as he uh, asked me to. The uh, prisoner on the other side, he didn't even get to say very much. It, they established that you wanted to talk to a reporter. Here's a reporter. We've done our job. He got to say a few things and then they cut it off and they were using it as a negotiation tactic. Today, barricaded inmates claim that the state is not telling the public their side of the story. When there was a, a project where they needed extra help, George would volunteer to do it. During the riot, somebody has to go out on the yard and bring in the food from the food drop. He figures, well, my life doesn't amount to anything anyway, so it might as well be me. And he goes out and he does these very dangerous things of going out on the yard at the risk of being shot mm. simply because he figures, well, other people need this stuff. Somebody's got to go do it. I'll do it. Uh, well, you still feel that you're comfortably in charge of the situation and control? I don't feel I'm comfortably in charge or in control of anything, but I can handle what's being put forth to me here. We want somebody a high-ranking official either in the State Highway Patrol or we prefer somebody in the Federal. And we want the news media. And the inmates want the prison authorities to demonstrate to them that, that A, they have that access, and B, that they're willing to let the inmates out of the story out. The media did not talk about the murders that had occurred at Lucasville where guards killed inmates. The media didn't talk about that. I know you want to know the whys and hows. Our major concern is getting our staff out, period. I, I sensed a lot of tension between the hawks and the doves on the law enforcement side as to how to handle this. There were many who wanted to handle it like Attica and just storm them. Others who wanted a peaceful negotiated solution. The prison system's reaction was to deliberately to stall negotiations. 
Prison officials have shut off water and electricity to cell block L and have reportedly had limited contact with the inmates holed up inside. Uh, Mr. Skates, for example, had gone out on the yard with a bullhorn trying to negotiate. I want you people to understand this ain't no fucking joke, boys. It got eight lives in there that we're all concerned about. Now let's get something rolling here. You're, you're not serious. And he was absolutely right. Okay, what, what is it you want again? A federal what? You want to get somebody to negotiate with that is sympathetic to our plea, somebody that will listen to what we want. George Skates very clearly stated over the negotiation tape, uh, you have until a certain time this morning to give us the water and to give us the electricity. And if you don't, you, you've got a dead man on your hands. And the prisoner had made a uh, demand, they made a demand over the phone, and also wrote down on uh, some sheets and placed it on the outside of the prison wall so the media could put in their cameras and zone in. More bed sheets out of the window today, written on the sheets a threat to kill one of their eight hostages if prison officials refuse to meet their demands. So when the media read that and they were talking to this first person, name was Tess Unwin, they asked her about the threat that the prisoner made, and she was basically saying, that is the language of prisoners, uh, we can uh, expect that. It's a standard threat, it's nothing new, we're going to kill a hostage. Prisoners heard that over their body operating radios, and from my understanding, because I was not present during the time that that actually took place, but the Lavelle became highly upset as a result. He took it among himself to become a renegade, to prove the point. Do you know what organization I represent? Yes, I do, Lavelle. I know you. One day after prisoners threatened to kill a hostage if their demands were not met. The body of one of the eight hostages, 40-year-old corrections uh, 50, officer 20, 20. Robert Blandingham, was wheeled out. When a guard is killed, that won't be tolerated. Prison authorities say they will be prosecuted. The guard murder was senseless, and not only was I troubled by his murder, uh, other people was troubled by his murders as well. One in particular I can recall was George Skates. He was deeply troubled by the guard being uh, executed. Once, once somebody affiliated uh, with the staff or the state, you know, has has become a victim, the the stakes jump dramatically. Everything changes. Even though there has been this unfortunate event, there has been a major breakthrough in negotiations. The breakthrough was a promise to air the prisoners' demands. The fact that after a hostage has apparently been killed, authorities allowed the inmates to issue demands on television raises questions about the state strategy. Robert Foson negotiated the Atticus standoff in 1971. I think the state has put itself in a, in a very uh, dubious position here between not having gone immediately and now facing what appear to be prolonged negotiations that could include more deaths. We have been oppressed here at SOCF and threatened by Warden Arthur Tate with abusive force. He demanded no punishment for the inmates involved in the uprising. And as promised, 26-year-old corrections officer James Demons was set free. I feel that the institution has done everybody just wrong by keeping everybody in there so long. Now, I knew Vet uh, Belanningham. He was a good friend of mine. The only reason that man is dead because he stayed in there so long because they want to cut off water and turn off electricity, which had me scared for my life in there. So I adjusted to the nation of Islam. One of the guards, dressed by his captors as a Muslim, was released today. I felt so touched and moved by his authentic uh, conversion that I gave him one of my Islamic garments. Yeah, and one of the brothers gave him an Islamic cap. But I do recall him and many of the other officers, they were dissatisfied with the slow progress with, the, with regards to the prison official. Now, here's what I'm going to do. i got a CO sitting here. Uh-huh. I'm going to let you talk to him. Who am I going to speak with? This is Officer Clark. This is a sign of good faith on our part. This is Daryl Clark, Jr. What these guys are doing, they'll listen to me. I'm listening Every to you. Every fucking word I'm telling you, guys. I'm all listening right? to you. I'm listening to you. Okay. Now these guys has risked their lives to protect us. You understand? I hear you. They've been giving us food, they've been giving us clothing, they've been making damn sure no one comes near us. We have not been touched in no way that you're thinking of. That's good, we appreciate that. We want and you to say Okay, Clark. They wanted to talk to the news and had that 
can't broadcast it, and it's over with. Okay, Officer Clark, we're going to try to get that. We want to get that. Now, I've heard you guys say that stuff before, and you never have come through that shit. I want your word, man. These good inmates have gave me their word that nothing's going to happen to us, and by God, they can keep it. I'm going to give you my word, Clark, that I'm going to do my best to get this worked out and work with these people. If you care for any of these hostages, me, myself included. That is our main goal and objective, to get every single person out of there well, safe. They're not asking for nothing but the fucking newscast media. That's all they want. And we're working on it right now. The powers that be are discussing it. And the reason that they knew that the prison officials were procrastinating is because we was recording the conversation we had with the prison officials. We took this and played it for the guards to actually hear. So when Demons expressed his resentment toward the prison official and was upset with him, he did that because he had first-hand knowledge from listening to the tape. One week into the riot, I received a call at home on a Sunday morning from the chief counsel for the Department of Corrections uh, informing me that um, they had been in negotiations with the inmate leadership. They had made some progress, but that they had reached an impasse, uh, that the inmates had demanded a lawyer and that they would like to give them a lawyer. Initially, the law enforcement side wanted to use me as a bargaining chip. Prison officials using loudspeakers told inmates who've taken over part of the maximum security prison that if they wanted a lawyer, as they had requested, they would have to let another hostage go. But the prisoners recognized that their only protection against being stormed was the hostages, so they weren't giving them up. Three inmate leaders met for about an hour and a half this afternoon with an attorney. Nikki Schwartz is an inmate rights activist out of Cleveland and he was called in by corrections officials. I was afraid that the Waco fire would fuel the hawks by saying this is the way real men deal with these situations. I think it worked the other way. I think it scared them. And I think that's what contributed to allowing me to meet with the inmates on Tuesday, even though they had refused to release any of the hostages as a, as a condition. They do expect that they will not be the victims of uh, unlawful retaliation. Their principal focus was uh, concern for their safety in the surrender uh, process. What would happen uh, not only during the surrender, but after uh, all of the uh, outsiders went home, uh, and they were left there in the prison with uh, the angry guard force. At mid-afternoon, the community watched what appeared to be the beginning of a peaceful surrender. This came after inmates and prison authorities agreed to a 21-point agreement on the inmate demands. They mostly had to do with prison policy and procedures, and an agreement that there will be no retaliation against the prisoners after their surrender. America's other major standoff by 450 rebellious inmates at Ohio's toughest prison ended peacefully late today, but it left a terrible toll. One prison guard was killed, as were seven inmates. And today, authorities found the bodies of two more prisoners inside the evacuated cell block that's been described as a disaster area. Ten murders, nine nine inmates, and I believe one officer, and they end up getting like 
47 convictions, <laughs> you know. My name is Keith Lamar. I'm one of the five men who was sentenced to death for charges stemming out of the Lucasville prison uprising. And it's more than five of us who were uh, wrongly prosecuted and placed in, in, in jeopardy as a result of the riot. Man, we got Greg Curry, D. Cannon, countless other guys doing life sentences. We don't want those guys and their families and supporters to feel excluded. They don't have a death sentence, but essentially they've been sentenced to death, life in prison. Uh, and leading up to this, there was a notion you never convict anybody of a murder inside of a prison. It just won't happen because you can't, can't get evidence. Well, that's not true. Uh, you, you lay your hands on a corrections officer, uh, and the state of Ohio is going to bring to bear upon you uh, all of their resources. It's, it's 2014. There will be no retaliatory action taken toward any inmate or group of inmates of their property. They were speaking in particular about two things. One, as far as us being victimized, or jumped on, some of us come up dead accidentally by the prison officials, and another one we were talking about in the judiciary system. The 21 points were the law enforcement's response to the 21 demands uh, of the inmates. I want the inmates to know, uh, expressly to know, that we plan to follow the, uh, the terms as set forth. There was some talk about problems with guards, institutional problems, and I'd like to think that a lot of those things were eventually handled. I really couldn't say. I haven't compared then and now. But those demands were not met because prisoners were jumped on after the Lucasville disturbance, and myself as well as other people was getting false charges. The greatest failure of the 21 points was the point that guaranteed, uh, purported to guarantee fair and impartial prosecution. Because the prosecutions were anything, turned out to be anything but fair and impartial. We knew that the state could not actually grant us amnesty uh, for crimes that was committed. We was only asking that they do a complete and impartial investigation and based upon the facts, if a person has committed a crime and the facts show that he committed a crime, and that person that he be held accountable for his actions. I believe it was July, Nicky Schwartz, lawyer from Cleveland, is a good friend of mine, called and said he was trying to take care of the three people viewed as the ringleaders, that he was concerned they have good representation and want to know if I would represent Sadiq Abdullah Hassan. My associate Rick Kerger and I uh, both uh, co-counseled on his behalf at the uh, early part of his representation. As we approached the prison, uh, there were picketers all across on the other side of the street with signs that uh, advocated quick justice, if you will, for the uh, inmates. Just execute them and get it over with is the basic thrust. They needed someone quick. The media, the public was in an uproar that there, were, there was a prison guard that was murdered. So we must expeditiously indict, find out who did it, and charge them with a capital crime. It's a death penalty case with a lot of pressure and a lot of publicity on the line. Yeah, they break, they break out all the stops. If it's a politically sensitive case, we have seen how the government itself interferes with the ability of the legal team to actually defend the defendant. There is governmental pursuit of particularly targeted individuals because of their political activity, and that is supposed to be okay. The prosecutions had, uh, had not been fair. Uh, and the principal problem with them was that the, the prosecution was armed with nuclear weaponry and the defense lawyers had slingshots. Uh, the way that the state legislators, um, you know, authorized millions of dollars for the uh, prosecution team and no money on the other side. Well, I suppose there was a limit, but I sure didn't see it being reached. The prosecution had the benefit of uh, all of the law enforcement resources of the FBI, the Ohio Highway Patrol. They had government-funded agency, the county prosecutor, the police, that can go out and get whatever kind of testing it might need to get done. We also um, very quickly realized that uh, there was going to be a, a shortage of funds for any type of experts that we needed 
that we'd have to fight for everything that we got. We had a client facing several felony charges, a capital murder count. There were four or five case, cases joined together, including his, and as I recall, they allocated a total of $1,000 for an investigation to be done by the defendants. It was just woefully inadequate. In addition, uh, there were special counsel who were paid uh, handsome hourly rates uh, to prosecute the prisoners. I was getting paid uh, sixty dollars an hour so it doesn't take a whole lot of time to end up with a hundred thousand dollars at sixty dollars an hour and, and there were months where I worked every single day. These fellows were receiving their own office salaries and also being paid a stipend on top of that and they were paid monthly whereas the defense lawyers were limited in the amount they could bill I think it was like twenty five hundred dollars and you couldn't bill until the case was over. It's really no business of the court what the executive does with its resources. They can choose to fund the prosecutor or not, that's up to, to the executive branch of government. We're supposed to have what's known as an adversarial process where one side balances out against the other. If I'm the state, I get what I feel I need. If I'm the defendant, I get what I can talk the judge into giving me. Nobody gets elected by not being tough on crime. Um, and a legislature that keeps carving away defense rights and courts that keep carving away at those rights and rewarding the prosecutors who cheat and rewarding, and they don't all. I mean, just as not all judges are dishonest. I mean, yeah, and it's important that I say that. But, but the system as a whole has an unfortunate and improper tilt in the wrong direction. And when prosecutors beg for that level playing field, which they do all the time, it's not just that they're not supposed to have a level playing field. It's supposed to be tilted our way. Frankly, it's tilted their way. We took our representation seriously, and uh, we did everything we could to provide fair counsel and fair representation. So we were uh, very aggressive, we filed a lot of motions, and uh, pressed as hard as we could to make sure that he got, that Hassan got a fair shake. When the judge, um, I think, saw an opportunity to certainly get rid of me because I was withdrawing in protest because they wouldn't fund the defense, um, he took that opportunity to get rid of Mr. Kerger as well. Judge Cox called me, he was the trial judge, and asked me if I could be ready to try the cases uh, with a new lawyer in a month. And I said that was ridiculous. There was no way I could be ready. He said, well, if you can't be ready, then I'll remove you. And he did. And subsequently, new lawyers were appointed and the case was tried, I think it was almost 18 months later. The prosecution followed a method of targeting the people it wanted to convict, the people who'd been most visible, who'd come forward as leaders. Let's not forget that from day one when Hassan entered the doors of the prison, he found God, he found himself, he found peace, he found stability, he found purpose, accompanied with his already unyielding dominant stands, he was always fighting against the oppressive prison policies. So he stood out. The center of these cases is the killing of hostage officer Robert Vallandigham, who was strangled in a shower stall at approximately 11 o'clock in the morning on April 15th. To this day, the prosecution has no idea who actually strangled him. I don't know. And I don't think we'll ever know. In one case, they'll say it was, oh, it was A and B. And in another case, oh, no, it was C and D. They don't know. The convictions for the death of Landingham stemmed from uh, a couple meetings that took place. So the, the people who have been convicted of murder are the people alleged to have made the decision at a meeting two hours earlier.
We have a tape recording of that meeting. They had FBI tunnel tapes that they secretly tunneled in. Under the institution in the tunnels. And drilled very, very small holes up through the floor and inserted uh, very small uh, audio microphones and recorded some of the actual uh, discussions amongst uh, some of the inmates. The state got lucky in a couple of the places that they poked through happened to be the places where the, the, the men that were leading this riot were having meetings. So we had tape recordings of what they were saying. Prisoners had no knowledge that these tapes was actually being recorded. Now there was a particular tape that's referred to as Tunnel Tape 61, where there's supposed to be an alleged meeting where prisoners are talking about executing or killing a guard if the demand was not being met. Now that, that decision was made and then was implemented. We don't know who was hands-on with the implementation, uh, but we have objective proof through the tape recording of, of a number of the people that were involved in that meeting and, and agreed that, that a guard would be killed. You had witnesses testify for the state saying that I was in this actual meeting. In fact, not only was I in the meeting, they made the erroneous claim that I was the one who had chaired the meeting, that I supervised everything, I controlled the whole process. Well, the problem was that when one actually listened to the tape, the tape clearly said that I'm not even in the meeting. There was something wrong with the so-called tunnel tapes, a key piece of evidence. He thought they'd been doctored. Chuck had a friend who ran a lab and was able to get him just for free to do a quick examination, and he confirmed what Hassan said, that the tapes were doctored. Ultimately, they were never used at his trial, so if they were, it was not an error that he could assign, but they were used with other people, and without the funds to adequately test those tapes, you couldn't prove what the government had done with them. And this objective evidence of the tape recording corroborated our, our witness testimony. As you can imagine, it's a very unsatisfactory tape. There are breaks, there are things you can't understand, they're static. This is our first format before we talk about it. You know, we know we won't be you know what I'm saying? This is out of good faith, like they shot their foolish good faith for the office. Do this as good faith for the well-being of your office. Cut the light, the water, and get your police out from under your feet home. So what they did was to get a couple of informants to take the stand and tell the jury, well, as to those parts of the tape that weren't very clear, here's what I remember. It's like a murder on a pirate ship. I mean, who are your witnesses going to be? They're going to all be pirates. The only other route to go was getting one group of terrified prisoners to agree to make up testimony against another group of prisoners, no doubt equally terrified, but for whatever reason, unwilling to break solidarity, unwilling to become snitches. We presented testimony from two eyewitnesses, one of them who can be heard on the tape, uh, and the decision was made amongst the leaders of this riot uh, that if the uh, water wasn't restored and if the electricity wasn't turned back on, uh, that they were going to kill a guard. Their prize witness, Mr. Lavelle, had actually said, not just in one trial, but in at least three of them. We didn't decide to kill an officer at that meeting. We said we're going to meet up later in the day and make a final decision. So it was, it was uh, great fun to hit a button in the very first meeting with them and play 30 seconds of them talking on the tape and then turn it off. So I could eyeball a witness and tell them, look, you're of no use to me unless you tell me the truth. A part of the story that was not told was how did the state obtain these convictions? Prisoners were, were, were threatened with a, a prosecution for capital offenses if they, didn't, uh, if they didn't cooperate, or they were offered various considerations if they did cooperate. This particular witness, he's an animal trainer. 
and he is trained. I mean, I, I saw with my own eyes, he, he could get birds on the prison yard to come down and land on his finger and feed them. Um, and he understood operant conditioning. He had an annoying habit of beginning every single sentence with, I won't lie to you. And, and I told him, I said, we're going in the courtroom, you're going to testify, you've got to stop doing that. And he said, well, I will when we get in the courtroom. If you can stop, show me you can stop. And he, he couldn't stop. And, and he knew what I was doing. And there was a newspaper, and I rolled it up. And, and whenever he would start the sentence with, um, I won't lie to you, I whacked him a couple times. And I think he started saying it a couple times, and he flinched a couple times. And within 30 to 45 seconds, he didn't say it anymore. If that's beating somebody into submission to get the testimony out of them that you want, so be it. A year after the uprising, the state had three men in adjacent cells. One of them was Sadiq Abdullah Hassan, who was the imam, the prayer leader of the Sunni Muslim community among the prisoners. The second was Skates. A third was an African-American named Anthony Lavelle. They called George out to talk to the prosecutors. He told them, for the third time, I can't help you. Mm -hmm. And turned to go back to his cell. They said, oh no, George, you can't go back. Mm -hmm. So I said, are you out of your mind? If I don't go back to that cell, they're going to assume that I've become an informer. They then took Lavelle out of his cell and began to process him. They let George come back. George went up to the bars between the cells and he said, I didn't tell them anything. And his son looked him over <laughs> and gave it some thought and said, I believe you. You can't give for instance, I don't know that we will ever know who hands-on killed uh, the corrections officer, uh, Vallandingham. But, but you, of course, would not go to that person and say, uh, we'll let you plead to a felony five if you'll tell us everything you know. I have never been as sure of an historical conclusion as I am of the proposition that it was Anthony Lavelle who killed the officer, which is supported by the testimony under oath of a dozen different prisoners, black, white, before, after. In some people's opinion, that's what happened in the case of uh, Anthony Lavelle being the person who is, is believed to have actually done the killing of the corrections officer, but turned state witness to avoid the death penalty. C can we go off camera for a minute? They convicted Hassan and the other four to death row based off of unreliable, discredible testimony. The special prosecutor specifically told me he didn't want these guys to have lawyers because um, he, he, if they had lawyers, they wouldn't incriminate themselves, and he wanted them to incriminate themselves. The state's key witness against Hassan was an inmate who later, after his conviction, stated that the state of Ohio coerced and bribed him to give false testimony against Hassan. Now that was the state's key witness against him that secured Hassan's conviction. None of the lawyers that I worked with, and I worked mostly with Doug Stead, gave anybody testimony. Uh, Mark Peepmeyer is an honorable man, uh, as were all the prosecutors that I dealt with. I can't speak for the whole prosecution team other than to say it would shock me if anybody would behave that way. Irrespective of what this crime was, this trial is a travesty. And it does not speak well of the system that it can't admit it made a mistake. Where you have uh, testimony from uh, prisoners who are getting um, very large consideration for their testimony, there is a question about its reliability. And, um, and I know that that theme ran throughout the prosecutions. A prosecutor can go to an inmate and say, if you testify in a way that puts Hassan at the center of this crime, 
I can make sure you don't get charged with any other crime, like capital murder. And in fact, if I, as defense counsel, pay a witness for his testimony, I can be prosecuted. I would go to jail. They would take my license and I would be arrested for obstruction of justice. It's always phrased as, you will tell the truth. But what's the truth? Who gets to decide what the truth is as part of the deal? And the answer to that is the prosecutor gets to decide. They make a judgment as to who they think is more likely to be the perpetrator and then they cut a deal with somebody else. And there's always that risk that you're going with the more persuasive or that you're focusing on the person who seems more hated, i.e. a Muslim in the prison is a lot less desirable to some people than somebody who's not affiliated with a religious group. Some of the inmates that, that committed serious crimes inside that institution agreed to talk with us. And, and we knew the evidence that we had against them. Uh, we knew the, the testimony um, that they had to offer. And in, informed decisions were made by the prosecution about who to uh, strike a plea deal with and who not to. Um, are there some people that got out of there um, without the sort of punishment that they would get in a perfect world? Of course. I do not believe it's been satisfactorily proven uh, in a f by a fair process that the three inmate negotiators were responsible for the death of the guard. The defendant, as he sits here right now, is presumed to be innocent. It's like he has a cloak over top of himself of innocence. That presumption of innocence, all by itself, without anything else, is enough for the jury to find him or her not guilty. Truthfully, you know, it's a presumption of guilt. I mean, the jury walks into the courtroom and there's that guy. Well, who do you th what do you think? Oh, we all thought he was innocent, but we just thought we'd try this case just for fun. No, you know, he's there because <laughs> there's a whole government here that's decided he's probably guilty of what he's sitting here in front of you for. And the, 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 the forces of the government are arrayed against him, and you, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, you know, your job as good citizens is to recognize that, of course, what your government is trying to do is to protect you and nail the bad guy. And that all happens without anybody saying a word, just because they've walked into the courtroom and because that's how it's set up there. And they know that. And that's what we all have to fight against. Now, right now, Hassan sits on Ohio's death row, charged with aggravated murder of Officer Robert Vallandigham. Yet there is no medical, physical, or scientific evidence. Eventually, you get to the point where you got to decide we're either going to do something or we're going to do nothing. Um, and, and in this instance, I think doing nothing was, was not a, dis a choice. Something had to be done. I don't know what justice is. I mean, God may know what justice is, but I do know what's fair. Did we give a fair opportunity for Hassan and the others to defend themselves? And the answer is we didn't. There was a huge thumb on the scales of justice, and if we can do that to them, then they, whoever run the system, can do it to you and me. Does the state have responsibility? Yes, because they didn't give a damn who they wound up sentencing to death as long as they got somebody, somebody visible in the conduct of the rebellion. The state wanted a capital case of conviction. The media wanted a capital case of a conviction. And that's what they got. The, the, the larger cultural issue there is it raises a question about what happens when a society turns toward uh, a total and to some degree endless pursuit of security. And around 1996, my wife and I read that something called a super maximum security prison was going to be created in Youngstown. And we kind of looked at each other and we said, what the heck is that? OSP is 520 torture chambers stacked on top of each other. In every prison system, there are certain, you call them what you like, outlaws, natural leaders, spokespersons, troublemakers. There are certain guys that other guys go to when there are problems, who try to do something about it. The idea of a supermax prison 
is to bring them all together, pull them out of whatever prison they're, they're confined in, and put them behind so many walls, so many electronic doors, that they can't cause trouble anymore. That place is, is a terrible tragedy, and the conditions there are unconscionable. They are in a cell 23 and most often 24 hours a day. They weren't allowed socks. They weren't allowed t-shirts. They weren't allowed anything to read beyond um, two religious books. If a person is in supermax, they are subject to hallucinations, hypertension, uncontrollable anger. We paid the first visit to a prisoner in Youngstown Supermax, and he was in an enclosed booth, and he was locked in, in a six by six foot space. You wouldn't think there'd be very much he could do, but that man was handcuffed behind his back, sitting on a concrete stool for the whole, let's say, two and a half hours of our visit. People who are living in those conditions and who want to resist within those conditions, their lives are so incredibly controlled and limited by the authorities that the only way that they can express resistance and that they can push back against that oppression is to put their lives on the line and to go on hunger strike and to refuse to participate in the continuation of their lives within that torture chamber. And when I left, I said to Alice, you know, give me a teaspoon so I can start tearing this place down. To point these things out is what the other side will call controversial, but it's based on the facts upon which this country is built. When we acknowledge that and understand that, then we can understand that yes, we have political prisoners in this country. Yes, we have a superstructure that is has been created for the purpose of control. The uh, prosecutions were so flawed, so dependent on the deliberate solicitation of perjury, the browbeating of prisoners to the point that they became snitches, that, that they ought all to be thrown out. These men should not be on death row. These men should not be in solitary confinement. They should be held as, as heroes because they were uh, the negotiators uh, in the uprising. They prevented uh, more deaths. in isolation in Ohio SHOE unit since 1993. At the present time, I sit here with a death sentence that the state conspired to manufacture for two years before bringing down upon me the weight of the full resources of the state of Ohio. And I ask all of you who may be listening, don't take my word for it. The facts are the facts. You have to get involved and read the facts yourself and come to your own conclusions. Stop and hold a serious investigation into these crimes committed by state officials under the guise of I was only doing my job. The whole trial has been said repeatedly said by the prosecutor that every man must be held accountable for his actions. I proved that. In 1988, I was caught stealing some jury, but I jury was dope. Because of my actions, I played guilty and was sentenced to two years imprisonment. In 1989, I killed a man. Because of my actions, I played guilty. I was sentenced to a term of 18 years of life in prison. 1994, I was charged with nine counts of aggravated murder with death penalty specifications. But because of my action, I pled not guilty. And I placed my life in the hands of uncaring people. And I can sit here and uh, I can beg you not to kill me. My faith ain't gonna allow me to do that. And I don't believe in what took place in this courtroom. Prosecutor here, 
evidence. He didn't coach witnesses. He didn't do news of things. But every man must be held accountable for setting up. There is one death penalty crime in Ohio. It's aggravated murder. The statute says this, no person shall purposely and with prior calculation and design take the life of another. That's aggravated murder. What we do when we execute somebody. Depending on who you are, maybe in Marysville, it may be in Mansfield, it may be in Youngstown. Some prison guards take him down a hall. They stick needles in the person's arms. They pump poison in his veins until he's dead. Now, I don't know how you can possibly talk about that as anything other than purposely and with prior calculation and design taking the life of another. I think the death penalty is an illustration of our um, failure to recognize the basic humanity of those who have committed crimes. And frankly, the system doesn't much care. We have a system that doesn't care. We have a, that's not capable because it's a human system, of making the kinds of, of distinctions with accuracy. You're willing to extinguish another life <laughs> um, because of a crime they've committed. You're essentially saying you aren't worthy of being human. You aren't even worthy of being alive. And in particular with punishment, it's easier in some ways to be harsh than lenient. It's easier to be um, simplistic in your assumptions than it is to actually tackle the really, really difficult issues of what happens when people engage in crime. But we don't have vocabulary in the United States that's really strong enough to actually tackle those issues. There aren't effective slogans, there aren't effective ways in which to communicate the complexity of all of that to the American public. I can go to death row for killing somebody, but won't nobody go to death row for killing me. why this conference is important, why it's important to re-examine. Uh, it was Orwell again who said, he who controls the present controls the past, and he who controls the past controls the future. So if we want to change the future in Ohio, we need to go back and re-examine the past and fight for the real facts of the situation. And that's all we intend to do here. And that's why we're here today, to tell a more complete story. I'm not here to say that, you know, the system is crooked, the system is this, the system is this that. This call is originating from an Ohio correctional institution and may be recorded or monitored. But I am here to tell you that there's two separate systems. One for those with money and the very different ones for the poor, which is to say that the standard of justice that one receives in this country depends on how much money you have, not whether or not you're guilty or innocent. If there's no rich people on death row, there's no rich people toiling like we have just to try to get people to hear about the shit that they, what they did to us. It's, it's, it's anybody just did a little bit, it's unbelievable, it really is. But you know, I learned about the system the hard way. I had a guy that testified on me in my case. They was asking him about what he saw, you know. And he said, you know, if you want to see it, contact Langley, you know, Washington, D.C. There's a mic because the FBI had implanted a microscopic microchip in his brain, and it's all on video, it's all recorded. I'm on death row based on the test, that type of testimony. I just want you all to have a sense of what's being done in your name. See, there's no physical evidence, there's no forensic evidence, no DNA linked to any other crime. That's a fact. It's also a fact that just as many people who testified on me, it was just as many people saying somebody else did it. That's a fact. But the jury in my case never get to hear those facts because the prosecutor is still doing his job. He hear those facts from me. I was there though. I know I didn't kill anybody. So I'm telling you with 100% certainty I'm in it. But I know you can't take my word for it. I'm not asking you to. But I'm asking you not to let them kill me on the testimony. Uh, somebody said they got microscopic market chips in their brain. <laughs> You know, I know why people lie. I know, you know, we, we, we got all these theories about how the system's supposed to work. And it's this real good line that you hear all the time that the prosecutor's job is not to win guilty verdicts, but to see that justice is done. And if you have money, that's the kind of shit that applies. And the prosecutor who went and get the guilty verdicts on these Lucasville riots, they got promoted. So I understand why they did what they did. And it was lucrative. They got paid a lot of money. 60 seconds left on this call. But this 20 years now, you done paid off your mortgage. You done sent your kids to college, man. Enough is enough, man. 20 years, enough. 
The time has come for America to hear the truth. 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 I don't have to tell you things are bad. Everybody knows things are bad. It's a depression. Everybody's out of work or scared of losing their job. The dollar buys a nickel's worth. Banks are going bust. Shopkeepers keep a gun under the counter. Punks are running wild in the streets. There's nobody anywhere who seems to know what to do. And there's it's no the way cause to of my sickness. Pain inflicted on the state of this nation. And everyone in it. From the streets of NY. The buildings are feeling. The ocean out in Cali. Everybody can feel me. There's a war going on outside. No man is safe from. The runs deeper than the kick of a bass drum. All is lost in this American holocaust. Bloody is all we get when money is all we caught. Can I please have a moment of silence for everyone in the knees without a means of reaching out of the violence? The black kid wishing he didn't live in the hood the white kid sitting spin wishing he could the kid sitting at home wondering where his mom is to the kid who doesn't know where ron is you're the reason that i keep writing a lot and i'ma keep speaking my mind if you like it or not when a is at the assholes and is the money e is for the evil that keeps the world bloody all is for the rights i have lost c is for corruption a at any cost i don't want you to oh to write to your congressman because I wouldn't know what to tell you to write. Oh, I know he's just trying to say I'm a human being. God damn it! My life.